Good evening, it's Monday, January 22nd. Dozens of family members of Israeli prisoners held by Hamas in Gaza storm a committee meeting in Israel's parliament, demanding a deal to win their loved one's release. Meanwhile, a report that Israel has given Hamas a proposal through Qatari and Egyptian mediators that includes up to two months of a pause in the fighting as part of a multi-phase deal that would include the release of all remaining hostages held in Gaza. Today in Brussels, European foreign ministers join in the growing international calls for Israel to negotiate on the creation of a Palestinian state in the aftermath of the war. U.S. and British militaries bomb eight locations used by Houthis in Yemen. It's the second time the two allies conduct coordinated retaliatory strikes on the rebels' missile-launching capabilities. On the eve of New Hampshire's presidential primary, almost every top Republican is lined up behind former President Donald Trump in the polls in the state indicate he leads former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley by quite a lot. Haley's the last major challenger standing in Trump's way. Vice President Kamala Harris targets Trump for paving the way for abortion bans around the country during a visit to the key battleground state of Wisconsin. Her trip, the first stop on a nationwide tour, focused on abortion rights, a critical issue in this year's election. A divided Supreme Court is allowing Border Patrol agents to cut razor wire that Texas has installed on the U.S.-Mexico border, while a lawsuit over the wire continues. By a 5-4 to four vote today, the justices grant an emergency appeal from the Biden administration, which is in an escalating standoff at the border with Texas. And nearly 30,000 professors, librarians, coaches, and other workers in the California State University system walk off the job today. Wages and more manageable workloads, key issues in the dispute. From Pacifica Radio and the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Maracle. Meeting in Brussels today, European Union foreign ministers asserted that the creation of a Palestinian state is the only credible way to achieve peace in the Middle East. And they expressed concerns about Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's clear rejection of the idea. The EU is the top provider of aid to the Palestinians but holds little leverage over Israel, despite being Israel's biggest trading partner. The 27 member countries are also deeply divided in their approach, but as the death toll in Gaza continues to mount, so do calls for a halt to the fighting. Representatives from Israel and Jordan were also in Belgium's capital for the discussion. The issue of Gaza's future has set Israel in opposition to the United States and its Arab allies as they work to mediate an end to the fighting in the besieged Palestinian territory. Over the weekend, Saudi Arabia's top diplomat said the kingdom will not normalize relations with Israel or contribute to Gaza's reconstruction without a credible path to a Palestinian state. The Biden administration announced today that it's sending its top Middle East advisor, Brett McKirk, to the region for hostage negotiations. McKirk is expected to travel to Egypt and Qatar this week for talks aimed at making progress in the negotiations to secure the release of Hamas-held prisoners and to discuss the war in Gaza. Administration officials say the trip is part of a renewed push by the Biden administration to get a hostage deal. U.S. officials acknowledge that reaching such an agreement might be the only path that could lead 
to a ceasefire in Gaza. Citing two Israeli officials, Axios is reporting that Israel has given Hamas a proposal through Qatari and Egyptian mediators that includes up to two months of a pause in the fighting as part of a multi-phase deal that would include the release of all remaining hostages held in Gaza. The two of Israeli officials reportedly said the Israeli war cabinet approved 10 days ago the parameters of a new proposal for a deal. Israeli officials said they're waiting for a response from Hamas, stressed they're cautiously optimistic about the ability to make progress in the coming days. According to the proposal, the deal would include the release of all remaining prisoners who are alive and the return of the bodies of dead hostages in several phases. The first phase would see the release of women, men, over the age of 60, and hostages who are in critical medical condition. The next phases would include the release of female soldiers, men under the age of 60, who are not soldiers, Israeli male soldiers, and the bodies of hostages. Meanwhile, a group of relatives of Israelis held hostage by Palestinian fighters in Gaza today stormed a Israeli parliamentary committee session in Jerusalem demanding that the lawmakers do more to try to free their loved ones. The action by some 20 people signaled the growing domestic dissent in Israel in the fourth month of the Gaza war against Hamas. One woman held up pictures of three family members who were among the 253 people seized in the cross-border Hamas rampage of October 7th that triggered the worst fighting between Israel and the Palestinians in decades. Some 130 remain in captivity after others were brought home in a temporary truce in November. Charles de la Desma reports. Dozens of family members of hostages held by Hamas in Gaza rushed into a finance committee meeting at Israel's parliament on Monday, yelling, you won't sit here while they're dying there. On Sunday night, family members set up a protest tent in Jerusalem and vowed to stay there until the government reaches a deal to free some hostages. The relatives of hostages have accelerated their protests in recent days, demanding the government does more to get their loved ones released. I'm Charles Dilatesma. At least 190 people have been killed, 340 wounded by Israel in Gaza over the last 24 hours. At least 65 were killed in the besieged southern city of Khan Yunus, according to medical sources, as Israeli forces target hospitals, ambulances, and schools where thousands of civilians are sheltering. The United Nations says women and children are the main victims of the war, with 16,000 killed. Karen Chamas reports. The United Nations have said that women and children are the main victims of the Israel-Hamas war, with 16,000 killed so far. The United Nations Agency Promoting Gender Equality has said an estimated two Palestinian mothers lose their lives every hour since the war began. In a recently released report, the agency pointed to gender inequality and the burden on women fleeing the fighting with children and being displaced again and again. UNICEF communication specialist Tess Ingram, who has just come back from Gaza, said a baby is born into the war every 10 minutes in horrifying conditions. Nurse webbed up has performed emergency caesareans on six dead women in the last eight weeks. Gaza's health ministry says nearly 25,000 Palestinians have been killed in the conflict. In Israel, around 1,200 people were killed during the October 7 attack by Hamas. The United Nations says more than a half a million people in Gaza, a quarter of the population, are starving. I'm Karen Shamas. Palestinians displaced by the intense fighting in and around Khan Yunus have been heading for Rafah. Correspondent Charles de Ledesma has that story. Thousands flee from the southern Gaza city of Khan Yunus on Monday as the Israeli military expands ground operations into the region. Most are heading for Rafah near the border with Egypt with some driving vehicles laden with baggage, while others simply walk with no possessions. One of the displaced, Ahmed Shurab, says, Where do we go? This is the 17th time I've left my home. Should I go to Rafa? Rafa's all one street. 
What do they want from us? Do they want us to be 2.4 million in an area that cannot be more than one kilometre? That's less than a mile. Meanwhile, representatives of the Arab League meet for an emergency meeting over the war in Gaza and the humanitarian crisis unfolding in the region. I'm Charles de la Desma. The global migration arm of the United Nations today launched an urgent public appeal calling for $7.9 billion in funding to aid crisis relief efforts for refugees and displaced populations around the world. The IOM pointed to insufficient support for global migration efforts after the U.N. released data last June that showed more than 110 million people worldwide had been forced to abandon their homes since 2022 as war, climate disasters, and humanitarian crises led to record-level displacements. William Denislow has that story. According to the IOM's Director General Emmy Pope, the funding appeal will help save lives. As well as protecting migrants, the money will be used to limit displacement and bolster legal channels of migration. This is the UN agency's first global appeal, with the hope of securing funds from the private sector as well as governments. The appeal seeks to aid roughly 140 million people, including migrants and communities where they settle. Pope says that a proactive rather than reactive approach to migration is proven to boost global prosperity and progress. William Denslow, New York. U.S. and British forces combined today to strike Houthi rebel targets in Yemen. The strikes were meant to lessen the Iranian-backed group's capability to fire missiles at international shipping in the Red Sea. Sagar Magani reports. The U.S. and British militaries have teamed up again to bomb sites in Yemen used by Houthis. It's the second time the two allies have carried out strikes in 10 days on the Iranian-backed rebels' missile launching capabilities amid months of Houthi attacks on commercial ships in the region's waters. Several officials say U.S. and U.K. warships, subs, and fighter jets took out Houthi missile storage sites and launchers. Speaking before word of the latest, strikes. If you're going to scrap with somebody um, and you can find a way to tie one or both of their hands behind their back, that's not de-escalating, or that's not escalating, that's de-escalating. That's taking ability away from the other party uh, to, uh, to inflict harm. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby says the strikes have degraded Houthi capabilities, but the chaotic wave of attacks and reprisals suggest the strikes have not deterred the Houthis and that the broader regional war the U.S. is trying to avoid is becoming closer to reality. Sagar Megani, Washington. The U.S. Navy's top Mideast commander said today Iran is very directly involved in ship attacks by Yemen's Houthi rebels. Vice Admiral Brad Cooper, head of the Navy's Fifth Fleet, stopped short of saying that Tehran directed individual attacks by the Houthis in the Red Sea in the Gulf of Aden. With details, reporter Rita Foley. Vice Admiral Brad Cooper, the head of the Navy's 5th Fleet, tells the AP that Iran is very directly involved in those attacks on merchant ships in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. He calls them attacks on the international community. Many ships are bypassing what they now consider a risky route, instead taking a longer trip around Africa's southern tip. What that means is higher costs for shipping, and that could push up global inflation. The U.S. has launched seven rounds of airstrikes on Houthi military sites recently. The tempo of Houthi attacks on shipping appears to have slowed for the time being, with the U.S. and its allies increasing their naval patrols in the region. I'm Rita Foley. The U.S. military says the search for two Navy SEALs lost in the Arabian Sea during a boarding mission is now considered a recovery effort. Jennifer King reports. In a statement, U.S. Central Command says that after an exhaustive search since January 11th, the two Navy SEALs have not been located and their status has been changed to deceased. CENTCOM Commander General Michael Eric Carrilla says we mourn the loss of our two Naval Special Warfare warriors and will forever honor their sacrifice and example. The military says that the SEALs were boarding an unflagged dhow from a special operations combat craft off the coast of Somalia when one commando was knocked into the water by high waves and the other immediately jumped in after his 
Iranian's teammate. The rest of the team eventually seized an array of Iranian-made weaponry. We interdicted a ship that was likely heading towards um, Houthi-controlled territory in Yemen. Pentagon Deputy Spokeswoman Sabrina Singh. That had housed or was carrying um, warheads, other weapons and capabilities that they've been using to launch um, weapons into the Red Sea. Jennifer King, Washington. Over the weekend, Israelis struck a site inside Syria, targeting members of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. Karen Chamas with details. Syrian and Iranian state media have reported an Israeli airstrike destroyed a building used by the Iranian Paramilitary Revolutionary Guard, killing at least four Iranians. The Syrian army has said the strike completely destroyed the building in the western Damascus neighborhood of Mazeh. It also said that the Israeli Air Force fired the missiles while flying over Syria's Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. The Israeli military did not comment on the strike. A few hours later, an Israeli drone struck a car near the Lebanese southern port city of Tyre, killing two people. The targets of the strike are still unknown. I'm Karen Chamas. You are listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online, kpfa.org. The first Republican presidential primary is set for tomorrow in New Hampshire. And as the last major challenger in Donald Trump's way to the Republican presidential nomination, Nikki Haley is hoping voters there feel so strongly about keeping the former president away from the White House that they turn out to support her in large numbers. America does not do coronations, Haley said in a VFW hall in Franklin, joined by her daughter and son-in-law. Let's show all of the media class and the political class that we've got a different plan in mind. And let's show the country what we can do, Haley said. It's an uphill battle for the former U.N. ambassador and South Carolina governor. Most conservatives want to give Trump another chance at beating President Biden, despite Trump's 2020 election loss and the 91 felony charges he faces in four separate indictments. With voting about to begin in New Hampshire, almost every top Republican is lined up behind Trump. Polls in New Hampshire suggest that he leads Haley in a state uniquely suited to Haley's strengths, although his lead is somewhat narrower than the 30-point blowout that he scored in the Iowa caucuses. Catherine Carley reports. After a second-place finish in Iowa, just ahead of Tuesday's New Hampshire primary, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is suspending his presidential campaign. He's endorsing Trump. He has my endorsement because we can't go back to the old Republican guard of yesteryear, a repackage formed of warmed-over corporatism that Nikki Haley represents. Trump's last serious primary opponent, former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, is questioning his mental fitness. Trump repeatedly confused Haley with former Speaker Nancy Pelosi on the stump. Haley insists calling attention to that is not insulting him. But when you're dealing with the pressures of a presidency, we can't have someone else that we question whether they're mentally fit to do this. According to the New York Times, the Trump campaign barred an NBC reporter from an event because of his coverage. The campaign denies the story and NBC has not commented. I'm Catherine Carley for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. Campaigning tonight in New Hampshire, Trump was to be joined on stage by three of his former opponents who have all now endorsed him. South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, tech entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy, and North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum. The show of force is part of a broader effort by Trump's team to lock up the primary and demonstrate the party is unified in rallying around him. Trump today picked up another important endorsement. Saga Magani reports. South Carolina Congresswoman Nancy Mays says she's backing Trump. Another blow to Haley days after Senator Tim Scott endorsed him. South Carolina's GOP leadership has largely lined up against Haley, who is arguing voters need to make a simple decision whether to move away from failed Trump and Biden policies. Do we want more of the same 
Or do you want something different? Trump says voting for Haley would keep the status quo. The radical left Democrats are supporting Nikki for a very simple reason, because they know she's easy to beat. Ron DeSantis ended his nomination bid yesterday, leaving Haley as Trump's main GOP challenger. Sagar Magani, Washington. With former President Trump expected to soon take the witness stand, a juror's illness abruptly forced a two-day delay today of a defamation trial over Trump's comments about E. Jean Carroll, the writer he called a liar after she claimed he sexually assaulted her in the 1990s. The trial will resume Wednesday. The change in plans came after the court asked for COVID-19 tests on all of the jurors. One of Trump's lawyers also hasn't been feeling well but tested negative for the virus, and his team wanted to postpone the Republican presidential frontrunner's next appearance until after tomorrow's New Hampshire primary. Julie Walker has more from New York. The court now awaiting COVID results on all jurors after one man was sent home sick. Trump was already in court. His lawyer, Alina Haba, agreeing to the delay, also telling the judge she didn't feel well but tested negative for COVID along with her law partner. Both were exposed by one of her parents. Trump's team wants to delay his testimony until he returns from Tuesday's New Hampshire primary. But a lawyer for E. Jean Carroll, who was also in court, wants the case to go on, the judge not committing either way. Last year, a jury found Trump sexually assaulted Carroll in the 90s and defamed her, awarding her $5 million. This jury is deciding on any additional defamation damages. Julie Walker, New York. A judge today ordered court records to be made public in the divorce involving a special prosecutor hired in the Georgia election case against Donald Trump and accused of having an affair with Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis. The judge says records must be unsealed in the divorce case involving Nathan Wade, whom a defense attorney has alleged is in an inappropriate relationship with Willis. The newly unsealed court records, however, did not include any references to the affair allegations. The judge put off a final decision on whether Willis will have to sit for questioning in the divorce case, but delayed her deposition that had been scheduled for tomorrow. Willis has defended her hiring of Wade. Meanwhile, Republicans in the Georgia House of Representatives have advanced a bill that would activate a new commission to discipline and remove state prosecutors. Some Georgia Republicans want the new commission to discipline Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis for winning indictments of former President Trump and 18 others. The commission was unable to begin operating after the state Supreme Court in November refused to approve rules governing its conduct. A bill in the state House of Representatives removes the requirement that the state Supreme Court approve the rules. The House committee passed it today over the objections of Democrats. Now goes to the full House for a vote. Lawmakers in Massachusetts are considering a resolution to convene a convention of states. That's a process voting rights groups said could put civil liberties in the country at risk. Congress is required to hold a national convention under Article 5 of the Constitution if two-thirds of state legislatures call for one. Catherine Carley files this report. There are very deliberate efforts to undermine institutions of democracy. So this is not the time to test an unprecedented process to try to make changes. Jeff Foster with Common Cause Massachusetts says if six more state legislatures vote for a constitutional convention, Congress would have to call one and America's founding laws would be up for grabs. He says a convention would have no limits, especially dangerous right now, and basic protections like the First Amendment might not be safe. Supporters say a convention is necessary to cut federal spending. Meanwhile, Donald Trump continues to say a president should be granted total immunity from criminal prosecution, even for what he calls crossing the line. And I hope the Supreme Court has the courage to do that, because otherwise you're just not going to be in a very strong position very long. It'll totally change our country, in my opinion. That's how bad it would be. That's also the former president's legal defense against charges he led in insurrection. And he has separately said he would be a dictator for the first day if returned to office. 
I'm Catherine Carley for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. The U.S. Justice Department is investigating after the Yuba County Elections Office north of Sacramento received an envelope with white powder that tested positive for fentanyl. Pro-democracy groups are calling out the latest attack on the U.S. election system, looking for ways to defuse the situation. Suzanne Potter reports. No one was hurt in this case. But Jonathan Meta Stein with California Common Cause says this attempt to poison or kill an election worker is despicable. It's to destabilize our elections and to scare the public servants who run them and to make all of us more fearful of participating in our democracy. The FBI is investigating envelopes with suspicious substances, including fentanyl, that were mailed to election offices in five states in November. A study by the group Issue 1 last September found that about 40 percent of chief local election officials in western states have left their positions since November 2020. Meta Stein blames the rise in threats to election workers on the litany of false conspiracy theories claiming that the 2020 election was rigged. We have to find a way to reach people who think elections are being stolen in America and verify for them that not only are their votes being counted, but that the United States, and specifically California, runs some of the most secure elections in the world. No evidence has surfaced to back up claims of election interference that would have changed the outcome in 2020. In one notorious case, former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani recently admitted in court that he lied when he accused two Georgia election workers of tampering with votes. A jury awarded the two women $148 million in damages. I'm Suzanne Potter. A divided U.S. Supreme Court today allowed Border Patrol agents to cut razor wire that Texas has installed on the U.S.-Mexico border while the lawsuit over the wire continues. The justices, on a 5-4 to four vote today, granted an emergency appeal from the Biden administration which has been in an escalating standoff at the border with the state of Texas and had objection to an appeals court ruling in favor of the state. The concertina wire is part of Texas Governor Greg Abbott's broader fight with the administration over immigration enforcement. Sagar Magani has more. The Supreme Court has granted an emergency appeal from the Biden administration over the southern border. A divided 5-4 court will let Border Patrol agents cut razor wire Texas installed along roughly 30 miles of the Rio Grande. The wire's been part of a growing standoff at the border with Texas Governor Greg Abbott, with state officials saying agents cut the wire to help groups cross the river illegally. The administration argues the wire gets in the way of agents reaching migrants as they cross the river. It asked the high court to step in after a federal appeals panel last month stopped agents from cutting the wire. The high court says the cutting can continue while a lawsuit plays out. Sagar Magani, Washington. You are listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. Online, kpfa.org. This is an hour-long newscast airing each night at 6 o'clock, half-hour edition on the weekends at the same hour. All of our newscasts are archived online at kpfa.org, and they're also available as subscription podcasts. I'm Mark Miracle. Nearly 30,000 professors, coaches, librarians, and other workers in the California State University system went on strike today across the 23-campus system after contract talks broke down two weeks ago over pay and working conditions. The CSU is the largest four-year university system in the country. Max Pringle reports. Contract negotiations have been going on for seven months. California State University's last proposal was for a 5% per year pay raise over three years. That would have been reflected on paychecks on January 31st. The union had asked for a 12% per year raise. Ray Baiko is a history professor at San Jose State University and a member of the California Faculty Association. He said the CSU's offer does not keep pace with the cost of living. The average full-time lecturer makes about $54,000 at the CSU. That's the average. And so 
What we're trying to say is that that's not enough to live on in the Bay Area. In a statement, the CSU Office of the Chancellor said the California Faculty Association's demand for a 12 percent raise and other economic demands, such as life insurance increases and raising the minimum pay, would total $380 million just this year, which it called financially unrealistic. San Jose State University history professor Ray Baiko said the CSU could afford the demands if it shifted its priorities. With the chancellor making close to a million dollars with uh, the presidents averaging about four to five hundred thousand dollars a year. These are the presidents of the, each of the campuses with, you know, about 100 students for every one manager. Average salary is about three hundred thousand. Baiko said CSU has more than 700 administrators earning more than two hundred thousand dollars per year. If you can continue to put money in management, we think you ought to put money in the classroom. The CSU reached a tentative three-year agreement with the Teamsters Local 210 on Friday. That agreement covers about 1,100 skilled trade and other staff. They won't be participating in the faculty strike. CSU says it offered two extra weeks of paid paternal leave, among other offers, to the faculty. The CSU said accepting the union's pay demand would mean having to cut services to students to pay for it. But faculty members said low staffing levels and increased class sizes are already impacting student services. For example, we have one administrator for every 100 students, but only one counselor for every 1,800 students. Brad Erickson is a San Francisco State University liberal studies lecturer and SFSU CFA chapter president. So there's a real imbalance where we have this administrative bloat of this expansion of the pay and number of management, but a shrinking faculty, particularly in the area of of counselors. Erickson said students' education has been suffering because CSU has been letting faculty go which means larger class sizes and overworked lecturers unable to offer as much one-on-one time with students. They have been laying off faculty, particularly my campus, San Francisco State. We've lost a couple hundred faculty in the last year. The strike is scheduled to last through Friday the 26th. No new contract talks have been scheduled. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris today each celebrated the 51st anniversary of the now-repealed landmark Roe v. Wade abortion rights decision. In separate speeches, they vowed to fight for reproductive rights and against extremists in Congress and in state legislatures. Vice President Harris promised that Biden would veto any federal ban on abortion, while Biden promised to sign legislation to codify Roe and restore reproductive rights. Christopher Martinez reports. January 22nd marks the 51st anniversary of the landmark abortion rights ruling Roe v. Wade, and 19 months since the Supreme Court overturned Roe in its controversial Dobbs decision. Vice President Kamala Harris spoke on the anniversary in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the first stop on her Fight for Reproductive Freedoms tour. She says for nearly half a century, people relied on freedoms protected by Roe. However, 19 months ago, the highest court in our land, the court of Thurgood and RBG, took a constitutional right from the people of America, from the women of America. And now, on the 51st anniversary of Roe, we speak of it in the past tense. She says now, one in three women live in a state with some form of abortion ban, and the 10 states with the highest rates of maternal mortality all have abortion bans. These extremists want to roll back the clock to a time before women were treated as full citizens. Wisconsin to the 1800s. Just look at what happened here in this beautiful state of Wisconsin. After Roe was dismantled, extremists evoked a law from 1849 to stop abortion in this state. 1849. 
before women could vote, before women could hold elected office, before many women could even own property. Harris noted that Wisconsin lawmakers are considering an abortion ban bill with no exceptions for rape or incest. She says if Congress passes a national abortion ban, President Joe Biden will veto it. But she says what's really needed is to restore the protections of Roe. And when Congress passes a law that puts back the protections of Roe, Joe Biden will sign it. Over at the White House, President Biden gave his own speech before a meeting of his Task Force on Reproductive Health Care Access. He was introduced by Dr. Thani Malhotra, an obstetrician gynecologist who described her work since Roe was overturned. Instead of only worrying about my patient, I now had to worry about the law, having to choose between my patients and prosecution. Biden says since the controversial Dobbs ruling, 21 states have abortion bans in effect, including a law in Texas under which doctors can get a life sentence for providing the care they were trained to provide. Get this. In Alabama, my mother would say, God love them. The attorney general is threatening to prosecute people who help family members travel to another state. Who help family members travel to another state. Folks, this is what it looks like when the right to privacy is under attack. These extreme laws have no place, no place in the United States of America. He says Republicans in Congress want to go, in his words, to even further extremes to undermine women's rights, with three Republicans proposing different national abortion bans. Let me tell you what they are. One is a zero-week ban with absolutely no exceptions. A zero-week ban with absolutely no exceptions. The second is a six-week ban. The penalty for violating it is jail. The third is a 15-week ban. The penalty is a five-year prison sentence. That means even if you live in a state where the extremist Republicans are not running the show, your right to choose, your right to privacy would still be at risk if this law was passed, if any of these were passed nationally. He says Congress must stop playing politics with women's lives and codify Roe v. Wade for all the states, and he promises to sign such a measure. Until then, he says his administration will be working to protect women in the wake of what he calls the Supreme Court's extreme decision to overturn Roe. And he says the American people need to keep making their voices heard so congressional Republicans finally get the message. Your voice will have a final say. This is not over. With that, I'm going to sit down and we're going to get to work. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. A state with some of the most liberal policies on abortion in the country is considering an amendment to its state constitution to further protect women's reproductive rights. Catherine Carley reports. Lawmakers in Maine will hear hours of emotional public testimony today regarding a potential constitutional amendment to protect abortion rights. Two-thirds of both the House and Senate would need to pass the resolution before it would go to a statewide ballot. Dania Bowie with the Maine Women's Lobby says the U.S. Supreme Court's historic decision to overturn Roe v. Wade imperiled everything from birth control to reproductive care. It is more important than ever to make our Constitution as clear as possible about how reproductive rights are fundamental human rights. Opponents of abortion will also be at the State House today and have called the proposed amendment immoral and unnecessary. Maine already has some of the least restrictive abortion laws in the country. Democratic Governor Janet Mills signed legislation last year ensuring pregnant people can access abortion services after fetal viability if deemed necessary by a doctor. The law also changed reporting requirements and strengthened legal protections for medical providers. Bowie says advocates for a constitutional amendment in Maine have taken cues from several other red and blue states where voters have successfully protected reproductive rights. So we are looking at the best practices but also understand that Like in those states, we know that voters are generally in favor of reproductive rights. Bowie says voters are motivated to protect abortion rights. Polls nationwide show women especially say candidates' views on abortion will be a key issue in the 2024 election. In Maine, more than 60 percent of voters believe abortion should be legal in all or most cases. I'm Catherine Carley. A Ms. Magazine investigation is looking at the case of nine anti-abortion activists convicted in an abortion clinic invasion 
who are now being prosecuted as part of a conspiracy against civil rights. Suzanne Potter has that story. In October 2020, the group forced its way into a clinic in Washington, D.C., harassed patients, and chained themselves together to block entry. Ms. Magazine reporter Amanda Robb says prosecutors established that the clinic violence was coordinated in advance. A lot of times when there is anti-abortion violence, the perpetrator is portrayed as a lone wolf, crazy actor that just went off the rails about abortion. This is the first time a group has been charged with conspiracy. Members of the group were convicted last year under the Freedom to Access Clinic Entrances, or FACE Act, but they have not yet been sentenced. The extra conspiracy charge could add 10 years to each person's time. Text messages introduced at trial proved that organizers planned the event well ahead of time and sought out people willing to face arrest. In September, former President Donald Trump said if re-elected, he would specifically pardon this group. And Rob says some in Congress want to go even further. And there is a movement in Congress among far-right lawmakers to repeal the FACE Act that these people were originally charged with and that people who murder abortion providers are charged with federally. During the Trump administration from 2016 to 2020, the number of reported trespassing incidents at abortion clinics increased from about 250 to more than 1,200. The number of reported obstructions of clinic access rose from 580 to about 2,700, and reported assaults rose from 36 to 54. This is Suzanne Potter reporting. Poland's Prime Minister Donald Tusk arrived in Ukraine today for talks with President Volodymyr Zelensky on how Poland can keep supporting the country in its almost two-year war with Russia. They're also expected to discuss ways of resolving a recent trade dispute between the two neighbors over grain shipments and trucking. Tusk returned to power in Poland last month and is keen to show that a change in government won't bring about a change in Ukrainian policy. His visit took place the day after Moscow installed officials in eastern Ukraine reported that Ukrainian shelling killed at least 27 people on the outskirts of a Russian-occupied city. The Ukrainian military denied it had anything to do with the attack. Meanwhile, at the United Nations today, Russia's foreign minister clashed with the United States and Ukraine supporters at a Security Council meeting where Moscow ruled out any peace plan backed by Kiev and the West. And China warned that further global chaos could impact the slowing global economy. Sergei Lavrov, Russia's top diplomat, told the Security Council that peace plans presented by Ukraine and its Western masters, his word, are a road to nowhere, and the sooner Washington, London, Paris, and Brussels realize that, the better for Ukraine and the West. Jody Jacobs reports from the United Nations in New York. Sergei Lavrov has told the Security Council here in New York that Sunday's bombing of Donetsk should be on the conscience of all those arming Vladimir Zelensky. Moscow has blamed Ukraine for the attack, while Kiev denied responsibility. At least 28 people were killed and 30 were injured. The United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs told the Council that the transfer and use of cluster munitions throughout the conflict are very concerning. Many members at the meeting called for intensified diplomatic efforts to end the conflict, and several have also raised concerns about the growing military cooperation between the DPRK and Russia. Jody Jacobs, New York. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has inaugurated a controversial Hindu temple in a ceremony that was live-streamed to millions of households across the country. Modi described the event as the beginning of a new era for India's Hindus. The temple's inauguration fulfilled Modi's decade-old election promise of building a temple on the site where a 16th-century mosque once stood. Critics have questioned the timing, calling it a political move aimed at boosting Modi's chances at winning a third term in the upcoming national elections. Priyata Brajazbazi has more. 
Prime Minister Narendra Modi led the prayer ceremony at the inauguration of the Ram Temple in the North Indian town of Ayodhya. Hundreds of thousands of Indians across India and many in other parts of the world celebrated the event by holding prayer gatherings and viewing parties. The 160-foot tall temple, still under construction, now stands on what was a disputed site for many decades. 30 years ago, the 400-year-old Babri Mosque was raised by Hindu right-wing mobs, creating religious fault lines in the country. In 2019, India's Supreme Court criticized the demolition of the mosque but handed over that land to Hindus, ending a decades-long dispute. Priyata Brajbasi in New Delhi. A protest against the far right in the German city of Munich yesterday afternoon ended early due to safety concerns after approximately 100,000 people showed up. The demonstration was one of dozens around the country this weekend that drew hundreds of thousands of people in total. The demonstrations came in the wake of a report that right-wing extremists recently met to discuss the deportation of millions of immigrants, including some with German citizenship. Some members of the far-right Alternative for Germany Party, or AFD, were reportedly present at the meeting. In the western city of Cologne, police confirmed tens of thousands of people showed up to protest on Sunday, and organizers spoke of around 70,000 people yesterday afternoon in Berlin. The AFD is riding high in opinion polls. Recent surveys put it in second place nationally with around 23 percent. That's far above the 10.3% it won during the last federal election in 2021. Simon Marks reports. Growing protests in Germany, where some are calling for the far-right Alternative for Germany political party to be banned after revelations that its senior figures attended a meeting where mass deportations from the country were discussed. The AFD is in second place in national polls in Germany, and correspondent Thomas Sparrow, with the country's external broadcaster Deutsche Welle, says it's the possibility of the AFD enjoying success in elections this year that fueled the meetings. The plans are basically there in case the AFD gets to power, let's say, in the eastern part of the country. That's a big if, because even if they did win win the polls in the eastern part of the country, that does not necessarily mean that they would be leading a regional government. However, after it became clear that that meeting did take place, that AFD politicians were part of that extremist meeting in many, many cities around Germany. Very, very, very big protests have been happening. Uh, Hundreds of thousands of people are going out to the streets to protest against these plans and against the Alternative for Germany party. The AFD says it's being smeared and that the country's ruling coalition is simply terrified of its rise in the polls. But the suggestion that millions of asylum seekers and so-called non-assimilated people might be forced out of the country rings alarm bells with its obvious echoes of Germany's fascist past. I'm Simon Marks. This is the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. The Ruckers, I saw you with your man, smiling, huh, a coach bag in your hand, I was laying in the coop with my hat turned back, we caught eyes for a moment, and that was that, so we skated off, as you strolled off, looking at them legs, god damn, they look so soft, I gotta take you from your man, that's my mission, if his love is really got to handle competition, this music break is brought to you by me, Computer Blue, host of Don't Disturb This Groove, which airs Mondays at 10 p.m., We now return to the Pacifica Evening News. According to new loosened guidelines from the California Department of Public Health, people infected with COVID-19 may go about their lives without isolating or testing negative as long as their symptoms are improving. California's top public health official, Dr. Tomas Aragon, last week rescinded the state's previous order which encouraged people infected with COVID-19 to isolate for five days. 
The new health order allows Californians with COVID-19 to return to work or to school as long as their symptoms are improving and they are fever-free for 24 hours without medication. People without COVID symptoms but who still test positive for COVID are not considered infectious and do not need to isolate. A statement from the State Department of Public Health says instead of staying home for a minimum of five days, individuals may return to work or school when they start to feel better. Dr. John Schwartzberg, Emeritus Professor of Infectious Diseases at the University of California Berkeley School of Public Health, discussed the unexpected new recommendations from the state with Brian edwards Teekert of KPFA's Corona Calls. I think some background is necessary in terms of understanding how uh, this virus is behaving. The, the best data we have for JN.1, which is now really the gorilla in the room, it's, uh, as of last week, the data suggested about 86% of all infections are due, due to JN.1. This, is not more, this does not cause more serious illness, but it is much more transmissible, and that's why it's beating out all of its competitors. We know this particular subvariant um, by the end of five days, if people are m- much improved, not no fever for 24 hours, we know that a lot of those folks, probably most of those people, are no longer shedding virus that could be transmissible after five full days. It should be noted also that the state's recommendations called for people wearing a mask when they're indoors for the next five days, Uh, whether or not that will be um, insisted upon by schools and by other institutions is unclear. But if you look at going back to the amount of virus shed, if you look at um, it's a bell shaped curve and the amount of virus being shed by six days is much far fewer people by seven days far fewer by eight days far fewer and by the time you get to 10 days there's very few people who are shedding viable virus that could be spread to other people but that piece of the bell-shaped curve between five and ten days is still a substantial number of people so when we think about this policy really what the policy is saying is that we're going to allow people back in schools or back in other situations indoors um, who are a a substantial number of whom are going to be contagious. And that is, as you're pointing out, Brian, that disturbs an awful lot of people. Well, I think you've laid out the arguments. Uh, Where do you come down on the advisability of this as policy? Well, this is a very nuanced issue. There are pros and cons on both sides, as you and I have been discussing. I come down that I think it's a little soon for the CDPH to have done this. Also, the Oregon State Health Department has done something similar. Those are the only two states that have really, quote, bucked the uh, CDC recommendations. I'm curious as to why we did it at a time in the pandemic when there's still an awful lot of influenza and COVID circulating. It seems to me it would have been more prudent to do this in March. By March, it's very likely, as if the last several years have shown, that uh, COVID is going to be much less of a problem for us. We know influ- how influenza behaves, and we know that by March, influenza is going to be much less of a problem for us. And so I think that having put it off, if we put it off until March, we would have probably prevented uh, a lot of the problems we may see from this. So that's why I'm saying this is a really a nuanced issue. I think ultimately we have to get to what CDPH is advising, whether we should have done it on January 9th when it was announced, or whether we should have done it on March 9th, when I think would have been a more prudent time to do it. Reasonable people can argue about it, but that's what I think. Dr. John Schwartzberg of the University of California Berkeley School of Public Health. Despite a recent uptick in COVID-19 hospitalizations and deaths in California, San Francisco is set to close its six neighborhood vaccination sites by mid-February. The San Francisco Department of Public Health cites budgetary constraints and decreasing vaccine demand. 
San Francisco ended its COVID public health emergency last February, aligning with Governor Newsom's lifting of California's public health emergency. But it was the end of the federal state of emergency last May that shifted most COVID-19 response resources to the commercial market. Democratic Congressman Mike Levin of California today unveiled new details of his newly announced legislation to plug a loophole in the Affordable Care Act, which could be costing many Americans hundreds of dollars. Scott Baba reports. Mike Levin and Linda Sanchez of California introduced the Health Insurance Premium Fairness Act. New legislation aimed at stopping a cost-increasing interaction between the Affordable Care Act and Medicare. Matt Herdman is with California Protect Our Care, a health care advocacy nonprofit that supports the new bill. This piece of legislation uh, is going to be incredibly important towards making sure that we can actually fulfill that promise of making health care affordable for all Americans. The Health Insurance Premium Fairness Act uh, closes a loophole in the Affordable Care Act premium tax credit system, which penalizes households where one member mages, or ages into Medicare. So if you have two people who get insurance over the uh, Affordable Care Act exchanges and one of them then goes into Medicare uh, and their partners, that can result in a little bit of a tax penalty. And this bill works to fix that. Under current law, health care exchanges don't have to factor in non-members when setting prices for health care plans, even if those individuals move to Medicare, which can lead to ballooning costs for households that find themselves paying for both. The bill would adjust the ACA premium tax credit formula to account for Medicare premiums paid by the household. Congressman Levin said that the bill would close a loophole that undermines the spirit of the Affordable Care Act. In short, the bill would restore the promise of the ACA to cap premiums. That's what this is all about. It would subtract the Medicare premiums paid by the household from the monthly cap in ACA premiums. More broadly, it would help build on the success of the Affordable Care Act by ensuring more Americans have access to quality, affordable care. This year, a record 20 million Americans signed up for an ACA health plan, and this bill will ensure that none of them face a surprise increase in their insurance premiums when that happens, when when one uh, becomes Medicare eligible, and that's going to save families thousands of dollars per year. Levin said that the bill still has a long way to go before it can be voted on in Congress and that he would be open to attaching it to a larger health care bill. Open enrollment for California's ACA exchange covered California ends January 31st. I'm Scott Baba, Pacifica Radio, KPFA. Getting through winter healthy means trying to protect yourself from respiratory viruses. January can be the worst month for those illnesses and vaccination rates are low. Jackie Quinn reports. January is a tough month when it comes to winter illnesses. Here are some tips on how to try to stay healthy. With cold weather keeping more people indoors for longer periods, we're more susceptible to catching the flu, RSV, or COVID-19. Health officials recommend being diligent this time of year. Try to stay in well-ventilated areas. Wash your hands frequently for 20 seconds, the length of the happy birthday song. And don't be afraid to wear a face mask again. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says COVID-19 is the top illness leading to hospitalizations, but only 19% of the American public has received the latest vaccine, which protects against the new variant JN1. And it's important to get tested if you're sick, so a doctor can prescribe Paxlovid for COVID or Tamiflu for flu, which has already killed 11,000 people this season. 47 of the flu deaths were among children. I'm Jackie Quinn. Dexter Scott King, the youngest son of civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr., has died after a battle with prostate cancer. He was 62. The King Center in Atlanta said King died in his sleep at his Malibu, California home. Dexter Scott King, dedicated much of his life to preserving his parents' legacy, became chair of the King Center, where he also focused on protecting the King family's intellectual property. Dexter Scott King, the youngest son of MLK Jr., dead at the age of 62. Partly cloudy tomorrow with highs in the upper 50s around the San Francisco Bay. Further inland, mostly cloudy with a high of 60 degrees. In the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow, morning 
clouds, sun in the afternoon with a high of 61 degrees. That's it for the news tonight for this Monday, January 22nd. I'm Mark Miracle. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. Tune in Monday nights on KPFA and kpfa.org starting at 7 p.m. with Africa Today with host Walt Turner. At 8 p.m., it's Transitions on Traditions, a soul sonic rhapsody of word, sound, and power that comes your way with host Greg Bridges. At 10 p.m., end the night right on Don't Disturb This Groove with host Computer Blue. That's Monday nights on KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.